Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to Bayside. As Pastor Thomas said, we're glad you're with us. Um, wonderful time just to praise the Lord. It is well with my soul. Amen? You know, we're going to remember that at, at the end of today's service as we have a time of communion and we reflect again on what Jesus did for us, dying on the cross for our sins, his body being pierced and his blood spilling on our behalf um, so that we could be righteous before God, so that we could say it is well with my soul. So we're glad you're with us. Um, we're going to be looking forward to that. Um, we are in a series on what we are calling the basics. But it's not just the basics. It's the basics with a twist. And we have been looking through um, Ephesians chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to that. We're going to start in verse 10. Um, but we've been looking at these different basics of the Christian faith. And the first one we looked at was God's Word. And, and we set a challenge um, to everyone in the congregation to read through God's word in 2013. Um, I think we might have our numbers up here for our totals. There it is. 238 Bayside'ers signed up um, to get through God's word in 2013. Three different ways you can do that. A year, 180 days, or 90 days. Uh, if you haven't signed up for that yet, there certainly still is time. I know it's February, but you can catch up. All the plans are in the back. But that was the first of the basics, which was God's Word. Getting into God's Word more in this year. Second of the basics was prayer. And, and we gave a challenge last week. Pastor Thomas did so well um, to be praying for all the saints Worldwide, And so what we're doing as a congregation is, is taking country by country and, and praying for the world. And, and this last week, we prayed for um, four countries in North America. Of course, the week before, we had prayed for the U.S. Then I think on Monday, we prayed for Canada. Then we went to Greenland. Then we went to some country I'd never heard of, St. Pierre. Yeah, 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 that's somewhere up there by Canada. And then, and then we prayed for, what was our last one? Bermuda. And that was on Thursday. And of course, um, then on Friday morning, which we officially kind of had Friday off from praying for the saints, but my little daughter, Selah, who's, who's our youngest, she's four years old. And um, she's usually the second one up in the morning. I'm kind of the first one. And, and she's the second one. And, and she wakes up and, and uh, she, said, she said, Daddy, who are we going to pray for today? And, and this little four-year-old, so filled with faith, and after four days, she was asking the question, who are we going to pray for? And of course, I said, no one. There's no one. This is not one of our scheduled days to pray, so just get that out of your mind. Let's have breakfast. No, I said, not really. And, and, but it was so cool for me to think that my little daughter, um, after four days, her mind was wrapped around the fact that we pray for others other believers around the world. And what a cool thought that was. And so if you have not signed up yet, these are in the back. Now, this is sort of the uh, paper version of our prayer guide, but at the same time, if you fill out this little white card and give us your email address, we will send you a document that has this computer, over the computer, and then what you can do, and I don't know if you've been doing this, we have, you click on this link of this country, and then it takes you to an Operation World website, which has all the statistics on that country, and it's really neat to kind of know even how to pray for these countries that we're praying for, so let's get that 156 number, uh, let's get it up, let's keep it going, if you haven't signed up yet, it certainly is something, we're doing it as a family, and you can do it as a family, so sign up for that, so those are the first two basics, okay? Um, God's word, basic number one. Prayer, basic number two. The third basic, and this is, we're going to start on kind of this mini-series within this series this morning. The third basic is the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ and what we do with that gospel. So let's take a look at this text again. If you have your Bibles, Ephesians 6, all the verses will be up on the screen. The very familiar text, we've been reading this often. We're going to focus on the last two verses this morning. Ephesians 6, starting in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. I want to pause for just a moment. You know, I think the reason Paul puts this in there, inspired by God to do it, is sometimes we can get under the misconception that our battle is with people. 
That, that the enemy in our life is somehow related to a person. You know, at our men's retreat last weekend, which was fabulous, Mark Brookmull talked about this, and he said, you know, so often we can think the battle that we are in is about a person, and it's not. As believers in Christ, our battle is never against flesh and blood. Our enemy is the enemy. And even as we remember communion, you know, there may be some people that you have been putting into the category of enemy that just don't deserve to be there. And and as we remember what Jesus did for us, let's remember we've been forgiven, therefore we, what? Forgive. Our battle is never against flesh and blood. We have to fight that tendency. Verse 13, therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. There's our first basic. Praying at all all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. That's why we're praying around the world for Christians in every country. Verses 19 and 20, that's our focus this morning. And pray also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Let's open in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we are thankful. God, we are thankful that it is well with our souls, God, and that is simply because of what you did in the sending of your son, Jesus. So we thank you for the cross today. We thank you for the gospel, the good news of our salvation, not because of what we did or could do, but simply because of what you did in the sending of your son. Father, I pray that the gospel today, that good news of Jesus would continue to change us, would continue to motivate us to the work of the gospel. So Father, we thank you. I ask your Holy Spirit to work powerfully now in this time. We love you, Father. Thanks in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Let's read verses 19 and 20 again quickly. Paul says this, uh, and pray also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Paul asked for prayer that he would be bold. He asked for prayer twice that he would be bold. Let's take a look at that word bold as we get started. Um, If you're taking some notes, you can, this might be a definition you want to write down. He's praying that he would be this in relation to the gospel. What does that word bold mean? It means to be confident, assured, candid, direct, or outspoken. That, that, That my proclaiming of the gospel would be confident, assured, candid, director, outspoken. So does boldness define my proclamation of the gospel? When I share the truth of Jesus, am I assured and, and, and candid and direct? Am I, am I even outspoken in my sharing of the gospel? Now, now, the one thing I noticed from this definition from the Greek is it doesn't say that boldness means obnoxious, annoying, loud or bothersome. Can I get an amen? That's not what it says. So so we can't think that that boldness means I'm obnoxious. But it does mean that I can be confident and that I can be assured in my proclamation, in my telling of the gospel. And at the same time, I can be very loving and I can be very humble. And those two things are not mutually exclusive. You know, as I was kicking around this whole, when when have I been bold or not bold? Many times in my life, in fact, many seasons of my life, I have not been bold with the gospel. I've been afraid to share the truth, maybe with a coworker at certain times, maybe with a friend, maybe with a neighbor. Do you you guys understand what I'm talking about? Have you ever been not bold in your proclamation of the gospel? Okay, I'm glad I'm not alone. (laughs) There have been significant seasons of my life where I just haven't shared in a confident, assured, candid, direct, or, or even an outspoken way. You know, I think for many of us, most of us, the gospel has changed us and is changing us. Amen? 
The gospel has changed us. It's made us, it's given us life, it's made us into a new person. And, and so I think we believe the good news. I think we believe the good news. And in fact, I think there's even something inside of us that desperately wants to share the good news. Isn't there? And yet many times we don't. And yet many times we're not bold. Even though this has been the greatest news that we have ever received, even though it's the, if somebody said, what's the best news ever? Jesus. E even though we know that and we believe that and we know we should share it and we even want to share it, we so often just, zzzz, we're just not bold. I, I, I was thinking this week about some boldness blockers. What are some things that practically block our boldness? And, and I think the first one is the heart of all of these. Number one boldness blocker is fear. Fear stops us from being bold with the gospel. What, what are we afraid of? And, and here's a list maybe from Mark's life at certain times. I can be afraid of rejection. I can be afraid that I will be rejected by the people that I share the gospel with, so I don't share anything. I think sometimes we can be afraid of ridicule. We're going to be teased. I remember when I was in school, that's a fair bit of time ago, but when I was in school, I remember I didn't want to be ridiculed or teased. I was afraid of that, so I, I didn't say anything. We can be afraid, maybe you can relate to this, of not having the right words. Do you ever feel that? Well, if I share the gospel, what if I share it wrong and I screw them up? Like, like somehow I'm going to be able to super invent God. It, it, but I think that. I think, well, I just don't have all the right words. I don't know the right, I, I just don't know what to say or I wouldn't have the right words. And, and so it's a boldness blocker. Sometimes we, maybe, maybe we feel like we're going to be embarrassed. Well, that's going to be kind of embarrassing to like share. You know, we don't talk about religion and politics. We just don't go there. You're not supposed to do that especially at work or with family or with friends or with anybody you know, especially there. We can be afraid. Fear is the number one boldness blocker. So how do we get through that fear? There's three other boldness blockers, and I think all of these three play off of fear. The next one is our enemy. Our enemy does not want us to be bold in sharing the gospel because the gospel brings life. And he is the God, the, 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 the devil. He's, he's about death. He doesn't want people to have life. He, he, he's to kiss, steal, kill, and destroy. So our enemy certainly stops us. He plays off of our fears, encouraging us, reminding us of all those things we should be afraid of in sharing the gospel. He plays off of that. Second, or the third thing is our culture. Our culture is a boldness blocker. Now, now why is that? Why would our culture not want the gospel? Well, the Bible pretty clearly says the gospel is a light and it's a light that shines into sometimes a dark place. And our culture many times would rather wallow in darkness than have some of the things exposed. The Bible says that, that the gospel sheds light and actually exposes the things that are going on. And so our culture doesn't want its stuff exposed. Therefore, it blocks our boldness. The fourth one is our flesh. Our flesh. Why does our flesh stop us from sharing the gospel? Well, our flesh is imminently always will be selfish. There is no redeeming our flesh. That's our old sinful nature. Can't redeem it. Doesn't get better. It's always all about, guess who? Me. Therefore, sharing the gospel many times is getting out of our comfort zone. And, and our flesh will never want to get out of our comfort zone because it's uncomfortable. So, so all of those things play off each other. Our fear, our enemy, our culture, and our flesh blocking the boldness that we need to share the gospel. So I was thinking about Paul because Paul wrote the book of Ephesians. He asked for boldness in two verses. He asked for it twice. Why would Paul, the super missionary evangelist, you know, do you ever get a picture of Paul in your mind like this invincible man of God who's just the most bold human being on the planet? I, I have. Why would Paul have to ask for boldness. There are two verses from 2 Corinthians that were very curious as far as Paul and maybe his natural disposition. Let's read these two verses from Paul, or from 2 Corinthians. First of all, chapter 10. I do not, Paul says this, I do not want to appear to be frightening you with my letters, for they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is of no account. 
Paul was not an eloquent, convincing speaker. One of my best friends in the world, he's, he's, he's not, a, he's not a, he, and he says it this way. He says, Mark, I'm just not like you. I'm not a talker. I'm just not a talker. Paul was not a talker. His speech was of no account. I want to take a look at that phrase in particular, of no account. Here is what that means in the original language. It means his speech was not admired, his speech was contemptible, and his speech was utterly nothing. Paul's speaking abilities were not admired, contemptible, or utterly nothing. Paul said he was not impressive with his words. He wasn't a talker. He wasn't convincing. He wasn't a great masterful orator. His speech was of no account. But that's not all Paul was. Look at the next chapter over, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 6. Paul puts it this way. There it is. There's Paul. He's not admirable. He's contemptible. He's utterly nothing. Let's look at this next verse from chapter 11, verse 6. Paul says, even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way we have made this plain to you in all things. Now that word unskilled is a very interesting word. The word unskilled, listen to what this literally means. The Greek word is idiotes. Does that sound familiar? You can figure out what English word we've gotten from that. But this is what that means. It means he's a private person, an extreme introvert, so quiet and private that he seems ignorant. Paul says, that is how I come across in person. That is how my natural disposition and bent is to be extremely introverted. In fact, I'm so introverted, people might wonder if I have any knowledge or not when I'm speaking to them. He's a great writer, masterful writer. We have his writing. It's unbelievable. But Paul was an extreme introvert. So let me ask you a question this morning. If this, if this stage up here was a scale from extreme introversion to extreme extroversion, where would you, where, 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 where would you fall? L let's just say extreme introversion is the, is the drum enclosure and extreme extroversion is the piano. Where are you? You know, I think Paul might say, I'm so, in, I'm so introverted, I want to be in the cage. If you can just get me inside there. But some people are so extroverted, they might want to stand on the piano and actually gather a group of friends around them that they haven't even met yet. Where do you fall? So, so, so God in his infinite wisdom took an extreme introvert who doesn't speak well, who appears ignorant and unlearned, and he makes him the greatest missionary and evangelist the world has ever seen. God takes an extreme introvert, somebody who finds more energy from being nowhere near people, and he says, I'm going to pick that guy. That's going to be my mouthpiece to the world. That's going to be the apostle to the Gentiles. That's going to be the guy that takes this good news and brings it everywhere outside the Jewish community. Now, why would God take an extreme introvert, a non-talker, and make him the greatest missionary and evangelist, in my opinion, the world has ever seen? So there's hope for all of us. There is hope for for all of us. It is not dependent upon your personality. It is not dependent upon your ability to put great words together in sentences. It's dependent upon your heart that is after him or not after him. As I said, there were times in my life when I was totally afraid to share. There were seasons in my life when I just wouldn't share, where fear stopped me. It blocked my boldness. Now, I can tell you this morning that I'm not at that place right now. Something changed along the way to move me from, from, from knowing I should and even wanting to share the gospel, but not, to still being afraid when I do, but being willing to. And, and, and you might ask, Mark, what did that? Is it becoming a pastor? Because I know you're up. No. God started this part of my journey a long time before I ever became a pastor. So what changed? It was the Saturday before Christmas, and I was at home, and um, two people 
uh, came to my door and, and they were very nicely, yep, they were at my door. And, and they were very nicely dressed and, 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 and they knocked and they were very respectful and, 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 and they asked if they could talk to me a little bit about some things. Have you ever had any of those people come to your door? Anyway, they came, and normally what I have always done in the past is, is, is I, I'm a Christian, thank you very much, um, so see you later. That, that, that's kind of my normal MO. No, I'm a Christian, see you later. God bless you, kind of. <laughs> you know, I don't know what to say. <laughs> what do you say at that point? Okay, that was my deal, but, 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 the, but the Saturday before Christmas this year, that, that's not what happened. I said, I said yeah, I let, maybe we can talk a little bit. You know, who are you with? Are, are you with any organization? They said, yeah, we're, we're Jehovah's Witnesses. And I said, oh, okay. And, and, and remember the Mayan calendar when everybody thought the world was going to end? And, and so I said, did you think the world was going to end? Because I know they've predicted that like half a dozen times or more. Okay, that was sarcastic. Um, I said, did you think the world, and they said, no, we didn't think the world was going to end. And I said, you know, I didn't either, if I'm honest. Um, I said, but yeah, why don't, why don't, you, why don't you come on in, and, and we can talk a little bit. And so they came in, and I said, I, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, you know, I, I, I am a follower of Jesus, and, and Jesus is very near and, and dear to my heart. He's, he's, he's my Savior. He's my Lord. He's my friend, all of that. Um, and, and also, in my mind, he's, he's God. And, and I said, what, what do you believe about about Jesus. And, and, and I know um, the Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe that Jesus was divine. They, they don't think that he was God. They think he was son of God, but he was less. He was less than, so he was not equal with God. And, and I said, what do you believe? Do you, do you think Jesus was God? And they said, no, no, we don't. And I said, oh, okay. Um, I said, do you mind if, if we open up the Bible? Do you mind if we go to God's word and just look into it a little bit? And they said, no, that's, that's fine. And they were, they were nice and I was being respectful and humble. And I said, can we just go to John 1? Like John 1, 1, I think, you know, John was Jesus' best friend as far as we know while he was on this earth. You know, he probably had a pretty good idea of, of Jesus and who he was and this is all inspired. And I said, let's go to John 1. And, and I said, in the beginning was the word. And I, and I said, do you believe that this is referring to Jesus? Because if you read on in John, it clearly is. And they said, yeah, this is referring to Jesus. And I, and, and I said, okay, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and, and the word was God. And, and I said, I know your translation. They have a translation called the Good News Translation, I believe. And, and they add a word in there. It's a very tiny word. But they add the word A right before God, and then they change that capital to a small case. And, and I said, I know your translation has, has changed that, and I'm just wondering why. You, you know, why, why did you change your translation to, to fit your doctrine? And, and they said, well, we're not linguists. And I said, oh man, praise the Lord, because I'm not a linguist either. I, I, don't, I don't know Greek, but I have this cool program on my computer, and it's called eSword. And, and it just, it, it takes you back. Yeah, here's a picture of eSword. And I pulled my computer out, and, and I said, can we just look at the original Greek? Because I'm not a Greek scholar, but, but if you look at the end there, it just says, word was God. And there's only, there's only three Greek words there. If there were four, they'd put the additional A in there. And, and I said, you know, word is, is yeah, let's, let's, if you curse her on that, word is the word logos, and we know that. And then, and then the word was is the word ane. And, and then the word God, of course, is the word theos. And, and I said, you know, it's only three Greek words. And, and, and I said, why did you make it four? And they said, well, you know, we don't, we don't know. We don't know, we're not a linguist. And I said, you know, there's other verses, and it was right before Christmas, and I was preparing a message for Christmas Eve, and one of the verses, I'd never shared this with the Jehovah's Witness before, but was from Isaiah. I said, can we just go to the Old Testament? And they said, sure. I said, let's go to Isaiah 9, 6. And, and I said, for unto us a child is born. And I said, w would you agree that this prophecy is about the coming Messiah, that this is about Jesus? And they said, yes, this most certainly is. And I said, okay, let's just read. And, and I said, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And, and I said, if Jesus... And I was trying to be as humble as I can, but I was getting kind of passionate. I said, but, and if Jesus is not God, then why in this one verse is he called God and Father? Why is the Son called the Father and God at the same time? I said, how can you explain 
how can you explain that Jesus is not God here? And, and they said, you know, I guess we can't. And then and they said, are you a pastor or something? <laughs> now, I'm going to tell you what I said. And honestly, I hope this is okay. You, you tell me if this was wrong. Are you a pastor or something? And I didn't know what to say. You know, I, I'm not going to lie. But I said, aren't we all supposed to be ministers? <laughs> I don't know. Is that, is that okay? All right. I said, you know, can I ask you a question? And they said, sure. I said, is one of us wrong here? And they said, well, yeah. Je- Jesus either is God or he's not God. And, and I said, let me tell you something. I will, I- I'll stand here right now and I'll fully admit I could be wrong. I-, I-, I might be wrong. Jesus might not be God. But would you admit the same thing? Would you just admit that you might be wrong? And then there was a little hemming and hawing at first. And they said, yeah, I guess that's a, that's a possibility. And my kids are there and they're just... <laughs> and I said, well, maybe it'd be worth it. And, and I told them, I said, I know you weren't expecting this. <laughs> I said, I know when you knocked on my door, this isn't probably not what you were thinking. And I said, but now you know how everybody else feels. <laughs> I said, but, but what about if we met again after you've had some time to, to look into these, even just these two verses? How about, how about if we meet again? I said, I said, would you be willing to do that? And, and it was a couple. And they were a beautiful young couple. And I could tell they were committed and they were passionate. And, 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 and I could see in the, in the guy's eyes, he was starting to, to like really wonder. And, 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 but it was his wife. His wife said, no, I, 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 I don't want to do that. And, and I said, I said, why? Why, why? why wouldn't you want to meet again? And she said, well, it's just not worth all of our time. It would be wasting our time and your time. I said, hang on a second. I want to say this with all respect, but it is very worth my time. I, I'll tell you right now, it is very, very worth my time to meet with you guys again. I'd, lo- I'd love to meet with you again. And, and I said, but tell me why it's not worth your time. And, and, and she said, well, you know, I, I, I can just see that we're not going to get here. I said, hold on a second. You just said you might be wrong. And, and I freely admitted I might be wrong. And, and I said, how many hours are you spending just today doing this? And they said, well, we're most of the day. We're pretty much all day. I said, well, you got a hot one here. <laughs> you got one that's like fully engaging in what you're presenting. I said, can we meet again sometime? And, and, and she said, well, I guess, I guess we could. I guess that would be okay. And, and so then I asked him a question. And, and I said, you know, what, what got you into, and I was, I was being respectful. I said, what got you into the, being a Jehovah's Witness? And, and the guy, the, the husband, he said, you know, to be honest with you, and I, I don't share this often, he said, I was raised Lutheran. And I said, okay. He said, but... But no one could explain the Trinity to me. No one. And and, and I said, you know what? The Trinity is hard. And and I understand that. And and I gave him some analogies. I said, you know, the Trinity can kind of be like a sun where you have the substance of the sun and the heat of the sun and the light of the sun. Three different things, but one. And I said, it's kind of like water. You know, the only natural occurring substance that occurs in three different states, liquid water and and, and solid water as ice and then vapor. and, And I said... But I understand it's tough. I I said, I get that it's tough. But just because something is tough, God gave us, you can't go anywhere on this planet and not see water. And and you can't go anywhere on this planet for very long and not see the sun. And, And so God took these two things that you are going to be able to see and grab and feel and hold or to know as a reflection of maybe one of the most difficult parts of his nature and his character. I said, but please, please don't think that the, that, that the Jehovah's Witness explained the Trinity. No, what they did is they explained away the Trinity. They didn't explain it to you. They explained it away. And there's a big difference in those two. And, and I said, how about if you're willing to meet, how about if it's just the three of us? Just, just me and you two and God's word. And, and both admitting we could be wrong, but letting God's word tell us what the truth is. 
And I said, how about you take as much time as you need to sort of prepare and think and plan and then the three of us get together and we open up this and, and, and we just see what this says. And they said, okay, that sounds good. So this coming Saturday, a week from yesterday, the three of us are going to meet. And, and I'll ask for your prayers at 11 o'clock. Um, my goal, please hear this, my goal is not to win an argument. Our goal in sharing the gospel is never to win an argument. My goal is to see a couple of people have the truth presented to them in a way that is loving, in a way that is humble, but in a way that is true. And so I'll ask for your prayers in that. You know, something changed significantly between the time when Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons or whomever would come to my door and I'd say, I'm a Christian, thank you, goodbye, <laughs> to a time when I would say, can we talk? Can we please talk? And, and, and after they left and they gave me their card and uh, that Saturday before Christmas, I felt so alive. I was so alive and so excited and so engaged and, 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 and I felt like I could have flown. And my mind instantly went to you all. My mind instantly came here to you because I wanted everyone in this congregation, everyone who is a part of Bayside, to be able to do what I did. To be able to have the confidence, the boldness, the verses, the knowledge, the experience to be able to go into a conversation with someone and share the gospel humbly and lovingly yet boldly. One of the reasons I think we don't share is because we are intimidated that people, and, and, and to be honest with you, most Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, they're, 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 they're trained to know that much more than you do. Okay, well my goal is this. Not so that we can win an argument or so that we can be arrogant, but so that we can share people, share with people the very truth and the gospel of Jesus. So that we don't get intimidated and, and, and send people away who are maybe very hungry for God, but are a little misguided in that. So that we can be confident and we can be bold and we can be humble and we can be loving. You know, I believe with all of my heart the gospel has changed us. It's changed us. And it is continuing to change us. But so many times when we're presented with an opportunity to, to share, we just don't say anything. We just don't. And my hope and my prayer is that this series that we are starting today, and this is just the, this is just the start we're going to be telling a story of a journey through stories, through scripture, through knowledge, through an understanding. Because, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses are only one small group of people that just need to hear the truth and the fullness of the gospel. You're going to encounter people who just dislike and even hate Christianity. What do you do there? You're going to encounter people who've been hurt by the church. What do you do there? You're going to encounter people who hate organized religion. Okay, praise the Lord. What do you do there? What do you do when somebody, when somebody just looks at life from a different angle? How do you bring the gospel? Because if we believe what we say, we believe the gospel is their only hope. Amen? And so how do we bring the gospel, the good news of Jesus, into all of these folks' lives in a way that is humble, and in a way that is loving, in a way that embraces people, but that doesn't shy away from the truth? And this is the start of that series. Today we're actually going to begin this, I think, in a wonderfully appropriate way, and that is through communion. We're going to take communion, and we're going to remember what Jesus did. You know, the communion is all about the gospel. It's all about what Jesus Christ did for us. And we're going to remember that today. We're going to remember the fact that, that when God created mankind, the picture was the garden. It was the garden. And it was perfect. 
And God made man and, and woman and, and, and he breathed life and, and then it was ideal, everything that they had. And God wanted fellowship. He wanted fellowship and relationship with his people. And then of course sin entered the world and created a problem. It created a problem for all of mankind and sin created a problem, our sin, for us. And that sin set a separation between what God ultimately wanted, which was simply relationship, working, loving, true relationship with his people. That's what he wanted. But sin set up a barrier and there was something instantly called hostility. You know, but God didn't let us stay there. He didn't let us stay there. He sent himself he sent his son. He sent the only person that could bridge the gap between God and man, and that was the God-man. That's Jesus. You have to have a foot in each world to be able to be a go-between between those two worlds. And so God sent his very own son, and he became sin who knew no sin. Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. Perfect. No sin. And then he died on a cross. He took all of our sin upon himself. He took it on himself. He redeemed us. Even though we were all of sin fallen short of God's glory, we've all sinned. And, and, and yet Jesus took all of that sin upon himself on the cross of Calvary. He took it so that we wouldn't have to. He died so that we would never die again. And then he died. But then in three days he didn't stay dead. He rose again. He was resurrected to new life, showing that we now will be resurrected to new eternal life when we die. And so that we will never, ever have to be separated from God. We will have oneness with God for eternity. Amen? And that is the story from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. That's the gospel. That's the heart of the good news that we, even though we sinned, fell short, fell far short of what God's perfect plan for us was, he didn't let us stay there. In fact, he just took, took the problem, the penalty, all the sin upon himself. And God's word says there's nothing that we can do to earn that. There's nothing we can do to deserve that, to work for that. It says all we can do is receive it by faith as a gift. God, thank you for becoming sin for me. Thank you, dear God, that you became sin for me so that I would never have to die again. Amen? That's the gospel. That's why we remember communion. As we take these moments to think about what Jesus did, let the gospel change you this morning. Let the good news of Jesus change something in you. We are embarking on a journey to share the gospel boldly. Well, to share the gospel boldly, the gospel must change us daily. Let's start that this morning. Amen? Let's pray as we prepare. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the good news of your son Jesus. We thank you for the gospel. God, we thank you that even though we sinned and fell far short and rejected and rebelled against you, you made a way. You made a way. And that way was through the body and the blood of your son Jesus. You gave yourself. And we thank you for that. Today we remember the gospel, the good news again. God, as we reflect now upon what you did in your sacrifice, your perfect, atoning, redeeming sacrifice, I pray that the gospel would change us this morning. May we be changed into thankful people, into the image of your son Jesus. We do praise you. We do thank you. We love you, and we know we only can love you because you loved us first. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We became sin, who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. 
love so amazing. Blessed. Apostle Paul, extreme introvert, not a Apostle Paul, extreme introvert, not a talker, put it this way. And pray also for me that words may be given me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. You see, God knew that we'd be filled with fear. He knew that there would be something inside of us that would not want to share. Because of all those boldness blockers, Paul asked for prayer for boldness. I think it's very appropriate for us, if there's any fear welling up inside of you about sharing the gospel in 2013, then it's very appropriate for us to say, God, I need some boldness. And maybe even to enlist and engage with our other brothers and sisters and say, I might need some boldness. I'm going to stand up here and say right now, I need some boldness. But the message, the good news, the gospel has so radically changed us. And there are so many people who need to hear this message of the good news of Jesus that we must be bold. Amen? If you'd like to pray with someone about anything at all, no matter how big or small it might be, come on forward and pray. Otherwise, have a great week and God bless.